A very good evening. You're watching CNN News 18. I'm Akanksha Swaroop. Now, running a coalition government will test Narendra Modi's political maneuverability. Moreover, managing a coalition government during his third term will test Modi's diplomatic skills. This time, domestically at home, as much as it had on external affairs during his first two terms as well. The opposition, particularly the Congress, is portraying the general election results as a moral defeat for Narendra Modi. In fact, they have called it a resounding rejection of his leadership. And that rhetoric is also perhaps a crucial factor why BJP-led NDA will need to keep its allies like TDP, JDU, LJP and Jan Sena pacified. Naturally, the big question that now arises is who will be in Prime Minister Narendra Modi's cabinet? That's what everyone is wondering ahead of Modi swearing in ceremony tomorrow at 7.15 p.m. at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Now, according to several media reports, the Bharatiya Janata Party is keen on keeping a number of high-profile ministries, including railways, home, finance, even defence. Sources have told CNN News 18 that the JDU will receive two portfolios in the new cabinet. The party has proposed the names of Lalan Singh and Ramnath Thakur, both senior leaders. TDP's Kinjarapu Ram Mohan Naidu will likely join the Modi 3.0 cabinet as well. Naidu is a three-time MP from Srika Kulam Lok Sabha constituency and Chandrasekhar Pembasani, the TDP candidate from Andhra Pradesh Guntur constituency, might also make it to the cabinet. Interestingly, the party is also eyeing the prestigious post of Speaker of the House. Reports indicate that the Shiv Sena has demanded a berth for Srikant Shinde, the son of Maharashtra Chief Minister Eknath Shinde. Now, the LJP led by Chirag Paswan will likely get one seat in the cabinet. Another party like the LJP's 100% strike rate during the election is JSP, which is expected to get one MOS. Apna Dal and Hindustani Awam Morcha may also get one MOS. And that, of course, is bringing us back to the big question, who will make it to Modi 3.0 cabinet? नाइनटीन सिक्सटी टू के बाद पहली बार कोई सरकार अपने दो कार्यकाल पूरे करने के बाद तीसरी बार वापस आई Let's quickly bring in our correspondents. I'm joined in by Pallavi, Arunima, Payal and Abhishek. If I could begin with you, Payal, of course, uh, the big question is about the most intense portfolios, not just defence, finance, but even the external affairs ministry. There's a lot of talk about uh, who will get railways. What are you learning from your sources in terms of the kind of jostling that's taking place over the portfolios? Is there any jostling taking place over the key portfolios, first of all? As far as the BJP is concerned, the BJP has made it very clear that, you know, whether it is the Home Ministry, external of the Ministry, Finance Ministry, or the Defence Ministry, that will continue to stay with the separate party which is leading the NDA. Because that is something which is an understanding between all the allies in the BJP, saying that these are very, very critical portfolios. And they need the Prime Minister's direct intervention, so that's why they will be kept up with the BJP. As far as other portfolios are concerned, remember, railways is a very emotional issue for both Nitish Kumar as well as Chirak Paswan. The fact that Nitish Kumar himself was a railways minister and the fact that, uh, you know, Chirak Paswan's father was a railways minister and it has a huge significance in the state of Bihar where people, you know, migrate from uh, Bihar to all parts of the country and would like to travel back and etc. And they need multiple facilities. As far as the TDP is concerned, the TDP actually wants uh, portfolios which are going to help them build up the growth story of Andhra Pradesh because the TDP leadership feels that, you know, under Jagan Mohan Reddy, the state suffered for five years, the coffers ran dry and there was no mm. development which took place as well. But as far as the sources within the India are concerned, they say very clearly that none of these parties, including TDP, have made any demands as such. They're basically saying that they would like a significant share in the cabinet and they leave, they've left the decision to the Prime Minister to, to give a fair treatment to all the NDA allies. So 
a speaker's position does not really arise because none of these parties have asked for a speaker's position and neither is the BJP really interested in giving the speaker's position to one of these allies. Well, so that's where it stands. No right. demands have been made. It's an amicably thought out cabinet and they hope that the Prime Minister will be fair to everyone. All right, Arunima, before we deep dive into uh, the, the discussion over portfolio, it's important that we ask you, what are the security arrangements like? Uh, give us a sense of uh, how it's uh, happening at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Well, it's a, it's a duplication of what we saw when the G20 summit happened. Uh, there are multiple heads of state, and Abhishek will be able to tell us more about that. Mm -hmm. But just like G20, there are multiple heads of state expected. So the security is not just at Rashtrapati Bhavan, but also commander-like security at the venues where these heads of state will stay, or the route that will be taken. So what was, uh, what was implemented at G20? There were DCP rank officers who were given sector-wise, they were made in charge. So similarly, throughout the Delhi, you will see grids being chalked out. Our all forces, not just Delhi police, the paramilitary forces, including uh, the National Security Guard commandos, they will be deployed to keep an eye on, uh, on the, in the sky and on the roads as well. The intelligence agencies will be on high alert to ensure that nothing untoward happens. Uh, just ahead of this oath-taking ceremony, there was an, an attempted breach in the Parliament House also. Uh, fake Aadhaar cards were utilized uh, by, by some people, and Delhi police uh, thwarted that attempt in no, no time. Inside the Rashtrapati Bhavan forecourt, we've sent reports uh, of, of everywhere, chappe chappe pe nazar, as they say in Hindi, but at the same time, there will be attempts made to ensure that nobody, none of the dignitaries, are put to any kind of discomfort. And not just dignitaries, common men and women are also being uh, invited. So there will be the rat miners who are heroes of the Uttarakhand Tunnel Rescue. Uh, there will be workers who have helped Central Vista, uh, you know, the rebuilding of Central Vista. So all of those will be also uh, ensured that while the security check is proper, they don't feel uh, awkward right. or at a loss. So as we see at the oath-taking ceremony, we'll be privy to a lot of representation of people from all stratas. But uh, Payal, who's running short of time, in fact, Payal, I may uh, pose the question in terms of how India will also be represented in uh, terms of the cabinet berths. We are also learning how there will be representation of each state which will be kept <clears throat> in mind. What are you learning with regards to the overall uh, representation? There's a lot of talk about how East will also be represented, considering we've seen the BJP being accused of neglecting areas like Nagaland, Meghalaya and Manipur. Well, to call that BJP was, uh, was not recognizing the Northeast area would be actually a totally false statement. The Prime Minister has gone to these states for more than 60 times uh, within the last 10 years, uh, more than any other president or more than any other Prime Minister of the country. The BJP is very, very keen on, you know, giving representation to the North East. So, so far you've had two ministers from Assam, Kiran Rijuju from Arunachal Pradesh, and you also had Rajkumar Anjan Singh representing the, uh, the government in the centre from Manipur, and Pratima Bhomik from Tripura. So, you can expect a similar kind of arrangement being made, somebody or the other being given a chance uh, as well, because these seats are also very critical as far as the country's fortunes are concerned. But the big resurgence for the BJP has been from the state of Odisha. So far you had Dhanendra Pradhan as the Union Minister from Odisha, and Ashwin Yashna is a Rajya Sabha member of parliament. But this time around, you can expect more representation to come uh, from Odisha as well because that is the state that is the state that, that has actually made BJP's joy the most. Given the fact that they are not only won maximum of the Lok Sabha seats from there, but they also won the assembly uh, assembly uh, themselves. Right. As well. So that's why I wanted to ask you, Payal, what are you learning in terms of who will bag the chief ministerial post, and also at the same time, if Odisha uh, and representation from the state as far as cabinet boards are concerned. Well, cabinet boss, we don't really know because the Prime Minister will know best as to what can really happen. You know, we've tried to take multiple names at multiple times and Pallavi and Arunuma both will agree that the Prime Minister comes up with a surprise and we are left to feel, you know, feel as if like we've kind of, you know, been, we, we didn't know anything of that sort. But as far as the Assembly is concerned, generally the practice of the BJP has been to leave typical legislative leader from within the ranks as well. So whether it's Mohan Yadav in the past or even Bhajanlal Sharma, they came from nowhere, hmm. but they could find themselves in the top hmm. position as well. So we can expect the BJP to pick one of the leaders from the ranks within the assembly because the assembly, because the state unit was the one that stood very strongly against the alliance with the BJD and they were very confident that they would be able to win the state. And they kind of delivered as well. All right. Many thanks to you, Payal, for joining in on the discussion. Pallavi, if I could bring you in. Um, is A.B. Vajpayee going to be on their mind now that they form their coalition, considering we've seen how successfully, uh, in fact, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government managed to uh, keep a TDP and a JDU also equally pacified, especially during the government of 2004? 
But I mean, we heard what the Prime Minister was speaking yesterday at the Parliamentary Party meeting of the NDA. And, you know, he sounded very confident. And he actually rattled off statistics and a timeline in history to make the point that running a coalition government is not something which is alien to the way the BJP works because the NDA regime has been there in Vajpayee. And even the Prime Minister himself has been running a coalition government. Or he's been a part of the NDA history. So as far as the PM is concerned, he's refusing to buckle under the pressure of this perception that there is going to be pressure on him. See, at his point of time, uh, the priority will be to get the economy on track. There has to be a mix in Bharat. There has to be the economic goals which have been pushed ahead. And more than that, it's not just about India. He has to send out a message to the world that he's not going to be a weak prime minister. Uh, the kind of congratulatory messages which are pouring in, what was the most common thread out across that, that we hope to do business with you. Right. Elon Musk also said that pretty much this way. He has to send this message out to the world as well as to his political opponents over here that, you know, I am in control. So he is super confident that, you know, that he can manage to do it. And it's a needless controversy stoked in by the opposition. One, being needlessly in a celebratory mode. And second, that his government is going to be a weak coalition government. Absolutely. On that note, if I could bring in Abhishek. Abhishek, there will be representation also in, in terms of the guest list. And when we look at Prime Minister's own popularity in South Asia itself, there's going to be a conscious focus on India's neighbourhood first policy as well. From what we are learning, take us through the eloquent uh, guest list that we'll, of course, also be witnessing tomorrow. Well, it, it, it has been... Uh prepared at a very short span of time and we have seen how the guests uh, from the neighborhood countries, they are willing to grace the occasion of Prime Minister Modi's spring ceremony, which is going to be one of the most historic after almost 60 years. Uh, we have uh, Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, then uh, Sri Lankan President Ranil Vikram Singh, Mauritius Prime Minister Pramit Jagannath, Maldivian uh, President uh, Moizu. Uh, these are all guests uh, who are going to be there. Uh, most likely Prime Minister will be also having bilateral conversation with these leaders post swearing in ceremony uh, and uh, this entire event that Prime Minister Modi's swearing in uh, ceremony has been a plank of what Prime Minister Modi's vision has been about the foreign policy of the government. In 2014, we had seen SAR countries being invited. Uh, Nawaz Sharif, the Pakistani then, Pakistan Prime Minister was also part of the guest list. In 2019, we saw Bimstick countries being invited and this time also we have seen all the major neighborhood countries with which India has a very strong cultural uh, and economic ties and developmental partnership, they have all been invited. Uh, of course, surprising was the invitation to uh, President Muizu because in the last six to eight months, we have not seen a very good bilateral diplomatic ties between India and Maldives, especially when Muizu, you know, more clearly expressed his chill towards China. So in that context, it looks like India, probably Prime Minister wants to start afresh and wants to see the India Maldives bilateral ties with new realities. Because, of course, Muizu has got a very sweeping majority in the Muslims with whatever foreign policy and domestic policy he has had. So in that context, uh, his visit that will be first to Delhi and his bilateral uh, you know, meeting with Prime Minister Modi right. will be something that will be much awaited. Absolutely. Arunima, you've also been tracking the movements within the JDU. We've seen a very, very uh, earth-shattering statement come in from KC Tyagi when he's also revealed that posts like that of the Prime Minister have been offered to the Bihar Chief Minister as well. With these kind of offers coming in from the opposition, how much of a burden is on the BJP at the moment to keep its allies happy, especially when it comes to... Um, unrealistic demands as have been uh, called by certain political pundits that of uh, say a special category status to Andhra or even the demand for a caste survey or even extra funds for a Bihar. See, uh, in terms of numbers, if you just go purely by numbers, if JDU were to go and join hands with the India Front and take even TDP alone, uh, they are 12 plus 16, which means 28. Do mm. they still cross the 272 mark? They don't. True. And the JDU realizes that. That even if they had to go to the other side, it's not as if they will be able to bargain as much as they can being on the ruling side. And Nitish Kumar is not just eyeing uh, the union cabinet here. He's also eyeing the general uh, the assembly elections that are coming up in Bihar. He knows that Tejasvi Yadav is snapping at his, at his uh, heels. He has promised 2 lakh rupees uh, to uh, the below poverty line Biharis. He has promised uh, that he will change the face of Bihar. He has always been known as Sushasan Babu, somebody whose administrative prowess 
was different from his predecessors lalu prasad yadav's uh, you know uh, era that mm. era was known as an era full of jungle raj law and order was a big problem nitish kumar and came back and he has kept that image that i ensured low communal riots happened i ensured that law and order was better women uh, you know uh, feel feel feet when they go out so he wants to keep bjp on his side till the assembly elections happen and ensure that he is projected as the chief ministerial face of the bjp jdu combined in the next uh, term as well and for that i think he is willing to give a little bit of an elbow room but having said that the comments on agnivir have already started coming out comments on uniform civil code on one nation one poll that those are already coming on camera on record essentially what jdu is saying is that this has to be a dialogue continuously to ensure best governance and i think we'll have to see how it goes from here on it will be week by week month by month for the right. next 12 month at least pallavi for a prime minister who's known to have a very ceo style of operating how do you see modi 3.0 different compared to 2014 and 2019 not just in terms of numbers but in in terms of even coalition dharma as it's it may be called Well, the best of CEOs have to take their board of directors together. So I guess the prime minister will be doing that, uh, and he will be expected to do that. I think a lot of uh, cue we are going to get when we are going to see the nature of his cabinet tomorrow. Who are the people who are being sworn in, and how, what are the portfolios they are being uh, given? Before that, it's all a conjecture. And as the prime minister himself pointed out yesterday, don't go by the breaking news. Just wait for me to come out with a shape for my cabinet. But that will be a huge cue if he's going to give meaty portfolios. Uh, to his allies, like say the TDP and the JDU, it's very clear that he's trying to reach out. Uh, I hate to use this word, but the body language certainly of the last two days, 24 to 48 hours, was one which he tried to project that look, I am taking everyone along, and they are also with me. You know, chatting with them, making them sit next to him, and you know the kind of one or me, the kind of words coming out from Nitish Kumar and Chandra Babu Naidu. It's not going to be easy, and I think he understands that it's not going to be as much of a cakewalk. as it was in the first and the second ones this is going to be more in true sense a coalition government and a coalition government always brings its challenges but what i saw during the end of dr manmohan singh's tenure or upa2 i don't think i'm going to see that yet at least as far as this government is concerned he'll have his way he's going to try and ensure that he has his way as much as possible contentious decisions may be put on hold for some point of time so maybe a ucc or talking about uh, the uh, you know the agni vir issue that is something which could be on the uh, the back burner i think the focus is largely going to be on the economy and he needs to have everyone on the same page which is why the distribution of portfolio akanksha is going to be very much of a True. key and an indication into the kind of government he is going to be running pallavi it's very interesting that you mentioned ucc and even the agni vir scheme and that's why i'm going to bring in arunima arunima what is your insight into these issues i know that the jdu has gone on record to say that we've already provided our backing as far as uh, uh, the issue of one nation one poll is concerned but what happens to the issue of ucc and uh, the agni vir scheme do you also see any kind of policy paralysis when it comes to the politics and the economics of the nation in fact on the contrary i feel that jdu tdp and the and the alliance partners from uh, various regions of india have more at stake if the economy develops uh, if prime minister modi backs for economic reforms i think the regional allies will back him to the hilt because that is what they want the focus on ideologically speaking the political uh, you know at the heart of bjp's politics and his manifesto uniform civil code etc as far as jdu and tdp are concerned those can wait they want the fruits of economic growth to reach the people of bihar reach the people of andhra pradesh because the mandate is very clear you know labharthi and freebies however much our economists might say that you know freebie politics is draining our, our resources out from the ground all of us who've traveled on the ground the reports are very clear people are looking for that money in their account people are looking for that ration uh, to feed them inflation is a big issue unemployment is a big issue so i think on the economic indicator on the economic reforms if prime minister modi presses the accelerator he will have both nitish kumar and chandra babu naidu cheering him on all right abhishek uh, let's now talk about what can we expect in terms of foreign policy from modi 3.0 will there be greater push on the indo pacific uh, overall policy as well what is it that you are learning in terms of how india will be maneuvering its own relationship with the united states a host of questions in fact being posed over there in terms of what our foreign policy in the next 5 years is going to look like 
Well, Lagansha, India has always been, uh, you know, doing a balancing act between West and the Asian giants like uh, uh, China. Uh, we know that President Xi Jinping has got a mandate for another five years. He's going to be very strong. And this is a time when China is going to flex its muscle. We have already seen tensions growing up in Taiwan Strait. In fact, uh, the Taiwanese president has congratulated Prime Minister Modi. Yes. Prime Minister Modi reciprocated to that. And that made a huge diplomatic spat between Chinese side and the uh, Taiwanese side. So that kind of explains India's role and India's uh, interest also in South China Sea. We have seen Chinese aggression in Philippines, uh, Philippines uh, also with Coast Guard. Then the entire Indo-Pacific is something that India wants to have a very strong architecture in terms of we have seen Indo-Pacific uh, being talked about between India, but India, uh, Australia, Japan and USA in terms of economic prosperity. But will it also move towards strategic uh, policy? That remains to be seen on the issue of uh, Israel. Uh, with new partners in coalition where, of course, the Muslims will also count and their opinions will also count. How the in, how India's policy on Israel's uh, entire operation against Hamas will go, that we, ha we have to see then. Uh, of course, the Russia-Ukraine war, which has been going on for almost two and a half years, and India has become a huge uh, economic partner of Russia because of the import that India is having of natural gas and oils from Russia. Uh, so how will India balance that economic ties with the rest of the world's uh, strategic interest that is ongoing in, in Russia. Interestingly, Ukraine. Abhishek, much is also being them. deduced about the silence of countries like Pakistan or even a Turkey, which have, in fact, uh, they're saying that they've made conscious efforts to stay silent as far as congratulating the Prime Minister is concerned, is one to make much of it. Well, of course, uh, I think uh, two major countries, Turkey and China, they have not sent any uh, you know, congratulatory message at the diplomatic level, uh, at the political leadership level. We have seen Chinese ambassador in Delhi congratulating Prime Minister Modi uh, and the BJP. Uh, also, the Foreign Affairs Ministry's spokesperson, they also, during their regular press conferences, uh, said that they do uh, see that the, the victory is going to have some impact and they look forward to having a closer relationship. But today, Indian Foreign Ministry spokesperson, uh, Randhir Jaiswal, he made it very clear that any relationship that will happen uh, going forward from here between India and China, that will happen on mutual respect and trust. And that is something that Chinese side has not been able to garner in the bilateral relationship ever since that Galwan clash has happened. Uh, though China has always maintained that the border clashes should be put at one small place because India-China bilateral ties uh, in multiple verticals is a huge uh, gamut and we should not entirely eclipse the entire bilateral relationship with just one incidence or the one issue of uh, you know boundary disputes. But India has always maintained that unless and until peace and tranquility returns to the bordering area, there is no point having a normal bilateral ties in all other verticals. So hold on to that, that thought, hold on to that thought. Arunima, if I could bring you in on this aspect when it comes to national security, we've certainly seen uh, the BJP utilizing that hefty mandate in its last two tenures to exercise a more muscular policy when it came to national security. How do you see this going forward now in Modi 3.0? See, as far as security goes, I think compared to UPA, Touchwood, India has been luckier. The incidents of terrorism have gone down. Uh, you know, UPA was plagued with, at one time, every Friday when we used to return to our Noida office from Newton's Delhi, we would dread because by 5.36 p.m., invariably there would be a bomb blast somewhere or the other. Thankfully, the last 10 years have been of peace. Uh, we've, we've controlled the situation relatively in Jammu and Kashmir also. Right. Yes, Manipur is an area of concern. But overall, national security-wise, I think things are under control. And that helps uh, you grow economically as well. But right. there are concerns uh, about national security. It's continuing at the level as it does. ISIS is trying to rear its head every now and then. PFI Carter is still there, sleeper right. cells. Uh, NIA, therefore, I'm afraid we have, we'll to, have to leave it at that. Arunima, I'm running short of time. Pallavi, I'd like your closing thoughts on what, uh, in fact, the BJP can now learn from the shock defeats it's witnessed in the northern Hindi heartland, especially Uttar Pradesh. I think that outreach will begin from the BJP. They're going to understand that UP elections round the corner. Uh, that is one state they just cannot let go of, taking people along people's policies, a focus on economy and development rather than either udar ki baate. I think we are, uh, uh, we are looking forward to some very interesting times and to use the Prime Minister's words before we wrap up. 
is when he says that after 10 years, looking forward to some good debate and discussion inside parliament. So for all of On us, that note, let's um, hope, in fact, the opposition also turns up in full force when those debates happen in the Lok Sabha. Many thanks to you, Pallavi Arunima and Abhishek, for joining in with your precious insights. The cat will finally be out of the bag at 7.15 p.m. tomorrow as the oath-taking takes place tomorrow at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. Many thanks to you for watching CNN News 18.